NASA's Space Launch System rocket's wet dress rehearsal is complete, and the agency reported that they met most of their objectives during the most recent test. Back in April, NASA's launch team encountered several technical hiccups when they attempted to load cryogenic propellants into the Mega Moon rocket's propellant tanks. Over the course of about a month, teams at NASA's Kennedy Space Center made the necessary repairs to the vehicle. Later, a fourth dress rehearsal on June 20 proceeded more profound into the countdown, and the launch team filled the rocket for the first time with its supply of 2.85 million liters of super-cold liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. During the fueling operation, mission team members discovered a hydrogen leak in the quick disconnect that connects an umbilical from the mobile launcher's tail service mast to the rocket's core stage. Engineers spent several hours analyzing the hydrogen leak and reconfiguring the countdown sequencer to mask the leak. The clock continued to T-29 seconds before the rocket's onboard computers stopped the countdown for safety reasons. The goal was to reach T-9.3 seconds on the final run, just before the time the core stage's main engines would ignite during an actual launch attempt. Despite the leak in the early cutoff of the countdown, NASA officials stated that the wet dress rehearsal met most of its objectives and that the testing campaign was successful. The agency plans to roll SLS and Orion back to the vehicle assembly building this week to repair the hydrogen leak detected and prepare the rocket and spacecraft for launch. NASA intends to return the Mega Moon rocket to the launch pad in late August. The agency will set a launch date for Artemis 1 after replacing the hardware associated with the leak. NASA is planning to build and deliver a nuclear reactor to the moon which would power a sustained human presence for at least 10 years. On June 21, NASA announced that it had awarded contracts to Lockheed Martin, Westinghouse, and IX, a joint venture of Intuitive Machines and X-Energy, to provide concept designs for nuclear fission energy systems designed for use on the moon. The contracts are each worth approximately $5 million. The funds will enable these companies to develop initial design concepts for a 40-kilowatt class fission power system, capable of lasting at least 10 years on the moon. A fission reactor works by splitting uranium atoms in a reactor to generate heat that then is converted into electric power. A nuclear reactor used in space is much different from Earth-based systems. There are no large concrete cooling towers, and the reactor is about the size of an office trash can. NASA wants the lunar nuclear reactor to weigh less than 6,000 kilograms and fit into a 4-meter cylinder because it would have to be assembled on Earth and fit into a rocket for transport to the moon. Afterward, a lander will lower it to the surface, and once it arrives, it will be ready for operation with no additional assembly or construction required. The energy produced from such a space reactor is much smaller, but more than adequate for the projected power needs of a lunar outpost. The system will be lightweight and capable of running regardless of its location, the weather, or available sunlight and other natural resources. Demonstrating such systems on the Moon would pave the way for long-duration missions on the Moon, and ultimately, Mars. South Korea successfully launched a satellite into orbit using a homemade rocket, bringing the country closer to its dream of becoming a new player in the space industry. The nation's 47.2 meters tall Nuri rocket, weighing 200,000 kilograms, lifted off from Narrow Space Center on June 21, soaring into the air with bright yellow flames shooting out of its engines. It was topped with four CubeSats that will carry out Earth observations, a 1.3-ton dummy satellite, and a performance verification satellite. The 163 kg performance verification satellite will help scientists prepare to launch more satellites in the future by testing satellite components and transmitting its trajectory data to Earth. Seventy minutes after the liftoff, Nuri succeeded in its mission of placing the satellites into a 700 km orbit above the Earth. South Korea has spent nearly $1.5 billion to develop the Nuri, also known as the Korean Space Launch Vehicle 2. The rocket, which is capable of lifting 1,500 kg to sun-synchronous orbit, is fitted with a total of six liquid-fueled engines. The rocket's first stage consists of four KRE-075 engines, which combine to produce 2,942 kN of thrust at sea level. The second and third stages contain one vacuum variant of the same engine. All six engines use jet fuel and liquid oxygen as propellants. South Korea first tried to launch a dummy satellite with the Nuri rocket last October. The attempt failed when the rocket's third stage engine shut down, and the satellite failed to reach low Earth orbit. South Korea plans to conduct four more test launches of the Nuri system until 2027, including one scheduled for early next year. It is also developing a new rocket more than twice as powerful as Nuri. The country aims to land an uncrewed spacecraft on the moon using its own rocket by the early 2030s. 
An Ariane 5 rocket, developed and operated by Ariane Space for the European Space Agency, lifted off from Europe's spaceport in Kauru in French Guiana on June 22, carrying a pair of satellites to improve broadband coverage in the Asia-Pacific region. The mission was the 113th launch of an Ariane 5 rocket since 1996, and the first of the year. It's also one of five Ariane 5 flights remaining before Ariane Space retires the rocket for replacement by the next-generation Ariane 6 launcher. The two payloads on board were Mia Sat 3D and G Sat 24, with a combined mass of around 9,829 kilograms. Both satellites were deployed into geostationary transfer orbit 40 minutes after liftoff, with altitudes ranging from 250 to 35,786 kilometers and an inclination of 6 degrees to the equator. Mia Sat 3D is a 5,648 kilograms telecommunication satellite built by Airbus Defense and Space. MIASAT, which stands for Malaysia East Asia Satellite, will significantly improve broadband speeds in areas of Malaysia and the Asia-Pacific region. MIASAT 3D has a planned operational life of 18 years. The 4,181 kg GSAT-24 is also a communications satellite, built by the Indian Space Research Organization for New Space India Limited. The satellite services include high-quality digital audio, data and video broadcast to all of India. The satellite will have a 15-year on-orbit life and be demand-driven, meaning its functionality will increase as more customers require its use. The next Ariane Space launch is scheduled for July 7 to carry out the maiden flight of Vega C, Europe's successor to the Vega Small Launch Vehicle. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX is working feverishly to launch a full-stack Starship prototype into orbit this summer. On June 23, SpaceX teams transported Super Heavy Booster 7 to the launch pad to begin the next round of ground tests. The prototype successfully completed cryo-proof and structural stress tests in April and May, before being sent back to the build site to install Raptor engines, engine thermal protection covers, grid fins, chines, and many other components. A few hours after arriving at the orbital launch site, Booster 7 was lifted for the first time by chopsticks on the launch tower and placed on the orbital launch mount. Seeing a rocket lifted with 33 Raptor version 2 engines was a sight to see, thanks to LabPadre. SpaceX can prepare the prototype for the static fire test campaign once it is fully secured by the launch mount's 20 hold-down clamps and connected to ground systems. Static fire tests will begin as early as Monday, June 27. The number of Raptor engines that will be involved in the first-ever static fire test of Booster 7 is currently not confirmed, however, SpaceX may begin with the inner three engines, before moving to the middle 10, and then the outer 20. If Booster 7 survives static fire tests in the coming days and weeks, it could be the rocket that lofts Starship into orbit for the first time. On June 23, SpaceX performed a massive nitrogen purge of the booster quick disconnect mechanism. It appears that SpaceX is cleaning out the cryo lines in preparation for the static fire test campaign. A similar purge of the orbital launch tower's cryogenic fuel loading system also took place last week. Starship's quick disconnect mechanism and associated plumbing were upgraded in April, and the purge will clean those fuel lines in preparation for the full-stack cryo-proof test, which could happen in July. As part of the engine development, SpaceX is rapidly testing Starship Raptor engines at its test facility in McGregor, Texas. Tests for the Raptor version 2 engines, the latest generation of the Raptor engines, kicked off in December. A most recent footage obtained from NASA Spaceflight's live video feed shows that a test conducted on June 23 ended up in a mishap. Around five seconds after ignition on a vertical test stand, a Raptor engine blew up, and clouds of smoke began to billow from the test stand. Since December, SpaceX has conducted hundreds of Raptor tests at McGregor, and engine failures on test stands are extremely rare. The previous major failures occurred on May 9 and 10, when two second-generation Raptor engines exploded on a horizontal test stand. Prior to that, on January 27, a test caused the engine's internal components to melt and emit green flames. SpaceX hopes to achieve more than 230 tons of thrust with the second-generation Raptor engines, a significant increase over the first-generation engines. As a result, SpaceX pushes the engines to their limits, resulting in occasional failures like these. SpaceX successfully fired an engine on another test stand just minutes after the anomaly on Thursday, indicating that failures are part of the plan. SpaceX has begun stacking Starship's second orbital launch tower at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. Last week, SpaceX completed stacking the first two sections of the tower. The first section of the orbital launch tower rolled out to Pad 39A on June 15 and was raised into position on the tower's foundation on June 20. 
The second section was rolled out to the launch complex on June 22 and was stacked on top of the first section the following day. SpaceX has spent more than three months assembling and outfitting the first six of nine tower sections for Florida's Starship launch tower. Railings, elevator shafts, hardpoints, plumbing, and other components are already pre-installed on the sections SpaceX stacked at Pad 39A. While each section, as well as all abbreviated plumbing and hardware will need to be connected after each stack, the process should be far simpler and faster than the methods used by SpaceX at Starbase. SpaceX is expected to prefabricate and move more tower segments to Pad 39A over the coming months to complete the structural buildup of the pad. Once complete, the launch tower will stand about 146 meters in height, making it the second tallest space-related structure on the East Coast, second to NASA's massive vehicle assembly building. SpaceX is also working on the massive rocket catching and lifting arms that will be installed on the tower. The chopstick arms components are already arriving at the Kennedy Space Center. The launch pad tower being built at Pad 39A is about 300 meters east of where SpaceX launches Falcon rockets carrying satellites and astronauts into orbit. According to CBS reporter William Harwood, SpaceX only has permission to build the launch pad and launch tower at Launch Complex 39A, but does not yet have permission to launch from it. NASA is concerned that if a Starship fails and explodes before or shortly after launch, it will damage the Pad 39A infrastructure. NASA recently stated that before granting permission for the launch, it must conduct a thorough review of Starship and evaluate potential risks posed by launches so close to the Falcon 9 launch pad. Now, let's move on to the updates from Starbase. SpaceX is preparing two different test tanks for an upcoming test campaign. One of the test tanks is Booster 7.1, specifically designed to test Super Heavy design changes. Booster 7.1 is similar to a miniature Super Heavy, with dozens of external stringers on top and bottom. The top section of the test tank is mostly identical to the top section of a booster, and the bottom section encloses an upgraded Super Heavy thrust dome. Older Super Heavy thrust domes, like the one used in Booster 4, had room for 9 inner engines, whereas the upgraded thrust dome has room for 13. Last week teams lifted and placed Booster 7.1 on a test stand known as the Can Crusher and installed a massive cap over it. Later, they connected 20 cables running from the cap to the test stand's hydraulic rams. During the upcoming crush test, the cables connected to the hydraulic rams will squeeze the test tank down to simulate the maximum forces predicted during flight. It's unclear why SpaceX chose to test Booster 7.1 after constructing two entire Super Heavy boosters based on the same design. If the test tank fails unintentionally during testing, SpaceX may be forced to abandon Super Heavy Boosters 7 and 8, wasting months of assembly and testing time. The E-Dome test tank, designed to validate the new flatter propellant tank dome, stands next to Booster 7.1. Because SpaceX has been focused on preparing Starship 24 and Booster 7 for static fire tests, it is unclear when the company will be able to devote time to test Booster 7.1 in the E-Dome tank. Teams recently installed a Starship satellite dispenser inside the nose cone barrel section of Ship 25 at the construction site. Once in orbit, the dispenser, like a PEZ dispenser, will spit out Starlink satellites into orbit through a narrow slit in the side of the rocket. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.